Chapter 1 The Cosmic Rainforest Empty your mind if you can. If you can't, then close your eyes to see the universe as it is. Not black, not white, some color between a dark red and a dark blue, shifting through yellow, depending on the source of light beyond for its brightness, but lacking real uniformity in any of this, shifting like liquid lightning. Really see what you see with your eyes closed. And onto this stage that a little old man with a long beard and a stooped back step. Call him Brahma. Call the stage Brahman. Call yourself Vishnu and see him make a lotus flower sprout from your navel to sit on. You're infinitely larger than him, and he sits there, shaping the space under the lotus into rain. A raindrop the size of the universe forms, and then spins until it splits in two. And then it begins to rain shining drops of conscious light. Let yourself see this face multiply as though into a mirror. Watch the face sprout in each of the four directions that he might look upon his work. Where the rain hits, it sinks into the essential substance already there, clings to it, and tries to rise up with this denseness in tow. The rain is called Shiva. The substance it shapes is Shakti, and the forms finding ways to return to the source are Atman. From this spinning ball, the high gods form, large globes of consciousness becoming self-aware. One of these self-shaping forms catches Brahma's eye, particularly. He sprouts another head out of the top of the four he already has a new neck lecherously stringing out like a yo-yo with a grinning face attached. The new goddess Saraswati notices and inventing bashfulness attempts to avoid the gaze of her maker. She zooms through dimensions of size and density, of time and eternity, to escape. And in every direction that dread head follows her, follows her. She screams out in revulsion, and terror at her maker. The rain, Shiva, which is now everywhere, forms into a blade and severs the neck at its base, at the roof of its four heads. It goes drifting down like a seed to plant itself in the forest floor. The bottom of reality, the floor of existence, is Kamaloka the world of desire where hell and demons make their home. The canopy is Arupaloka, where the great gods called Devas float, and the concerns of the other two worlds are nothing, and all is peace and freedom, and to see the sun, one has but to pop a head out of the leaves that make up the highest layers of reality. Trapped in the understory between desire and liberty is the world of Rupaloka, where men and monkeys must live. Now, sprouting from this base world of desire, Kamaloka, are the demons, pure form wet with the rain of consciousness, seeking, always seeking some greater form for itself with no interest in reaching anything higher than that desire to spread and control. Splitting like millions of eggs, hatching out kingdoms and legions, sticking and swallowing and grasping ceaselessly in an anarchic quest for totalitarian reign. Above their hawing, the gods place themselves in alignment with their own proper place into a kingdom that shapes the cosmos, growing towards the light of wisdom. 
they pull swaths of Shakti, that ethereal energy that pools at the bottom of reality, up like clay. And they guide substance into suns and planets, plants and animals. They nurture what will grow and prune what grows too much. They shape as sculptors shape clay and stone, finding the shape within the Shakti, bestowing it with some of their consciousness, but nurturing the flow of life within each piece. Those demons who see their shaping see competition for control of the substance. These beings of pure power, pure form, war with the gods through eternity, seeking to conquer planets, souls, worlds. Into this dance of red and blue, of light and dark, arises Ravana, the ten-headed demon priest king. He has two brothers, Kumbhakarna and Vibhishana. These three set out to overcome the gods by asking gifts from the creator, the god Brahma. First, of course, they have to meet him. The way to do this? Pray, fast, and make good tapas. Not Spanish appetizers, but a word meaning something like fire in Sanskrit and re referring to ascetic practices. Vibhishana takes the easiest path, simply sitting and meditating on his name and figure, shaping Brahma within the cosmos of his own mind until his imagination becomes more real to him than the world around him. Vibhishana bows to him and says, My request is simple. I want only to have my mind fixed at the feet of the Lord. Let it be as pure as lotus leaves. Please grant me the strength to always be at the feet of the divine and to see the Godhead. And so from that moment, Vibhishana can see the whole show from top to bottom with a dispassionate mind. Kumbhakarna throws himself headlong into the elements, standing in the sun of summer, the ice of winter, the wind of autumn, and the rain of spring. He does this until he feels that he is the creator of these things, is in fact the creator. This results in an odd conversation where both, both sides speak from the same mouth. He's had a long time to think of what he would like to wish for. He wants an end to the interference of the gods in the dealings of the demons. He wants an end to the gods. The word for the extinction of the devas would be nir deva tvam. The word rests right on the tip of his tongue, but so too does Brahma, the father of all things, demon and deva, and where Brahma is, so is Brahma's wife, Saraswati. She did warm up to him after the freakish growing neck incident, as happens. She sits upon his tongue, as the division between husband and wife and pairings of gods is not so distinct as it is on the lower planes. Lord Creator, for my well earned boon, I wish for, so as lumbering fat Kumbhakarna, exhausted Kumbhakarna, wiggles his tongue to form the words, Saraswati applies the slight bit of pressure to shift the sounds. Nidravatva, the meaning of Nidra, is sleep. He drops into the extinction of a deep, slow sleep, which, to be fair, he probably really needs after all of these centuries of punishment. Ah, but what has Ravana, the first brother, been doing? Quite some time before, Ravana had climbed up a very tall mountain and stood there unmoving except once every thousand years. Every thousand years, he cuts off one of his heads originally totaling ten. Nine thousand years have passed atop this great peak, cold, alone, bored, and a great deal of pain. Nine thousand years have passed no more quickly for him than they would for you. 
Kum Bakarna down below has slept for centuries. He sits peacefully in his home. Ravana wears agony as perhaps none have conceived of it before or since. And in his mind, he relishes in it with absolute determination. Energy comes flying off of him. Tapa, so intense, is like a cigarette burning a hole in Brahma's wrist so that he cannot help but pay attention from the peak of his lotus seat. Ravana's fervor has blasted him into the very mind of God. Smoothly, Ravana lifts the cutting blade again. Another thousand years pass, and just as Shiva had severed Brahma's head before, smoothly Ravana slices the last tie between his head and his body. To Brahma, this corpse sort of feels like a cigarette dropped down his drawers. He's gotta go and get it out. Brahma snaps his fingers. The crater peers next to Ram Ravana on the mountainside. Ravana's last head blinking up at him a few steps away with the large body that had carried it and says, Okay, I'm impressed. What do you want? With a wave of his hand, all ten heads roll back under Ravana's shoulders. The oldest is just a skull with skin slacking off of it and growing back as it scrapes over the stone face of the mountain back to its original place. Running his fingers across ten separate necks, he says, First, I would like to talk to you about my brother. Yes? Well, the boon you gave him, Lord Brahma. The boon he was promised was not a boon, but a curse, and so really, he trails off, careful not to offend the source of his existence. Is it not the boon to sleep forever? to live in a world of pure peace and pleasure. Well, Lord, it was not what he intended to ask for, and it is a curse to be apart from one's family. Well, you can use your boon to remedy the situation as you see fit. I am not asking now for my boon, Lord Creator, but only for justice. Is it right to give a gift that is unwanted? Eternal, ceaseless sleep is unnatural. I care for my brother, Lord. A demon speaks of what is natural. He is quite happy in his dreams, but very well. I must admit that you are right. So now he shall sleep and wake each for half the year. Sleeping he will be at peace. Waking he shall be insatiable in all of his desires. Does that satisfy your request? It was not a request, Lord, but merely a petition. Then what is to be your request? I want to live forever, replies Ravana. And Brahma tugs on his beard. Brahma lets out a breath. Can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? I cut off ten of my heads the only ten I have, and stood on this mountain for ten thousand years without sleeping, eating, or drinking, and you can't even make me immortal? I can't make you live forever. Even I won't live forever, as mountains fade into the sea. Even their creator slips back into the universal dream. Sorry, it just won't work. Why not ask for something else? And Brahma pulls out a chalice of the nectar of immortality, which will make anyone who drinks it live a very long time and be very hard to kill. He offers it to the very ragged demon in front of him. Okay, then, says Ravana, drinking in frustration. I want immunity to gods and demons, angels, snakes, wild beasts, diseases, vermin, spiders, any of those various things that might kill the unsuspecting or the impertinent. As he rounds off the well-thought-out list, Brahma asks him, What about humans and monkeys? Don't you want to be invulnerable to them? Ravana laughs. Humans and monkeys? <laughs> what would they do? Throw sticks and feces at me? Bah! 
have no fear of humans or monkeys. Brahma gives a wry grin. Well, let it be, then. Your wish is granted. Go in peace. And Ravana goes on to make war on the whole universe. He even makes his way down to the kingdom of Yama, the god of death. Yama has a sword that can kill anything, and when it is about to kill Ravana, Brahma pops up in front of him, quite upset. Yama. You can't kill him, says the creator. It wouldn't make the universe. The universe is built upon my divine will. If that will is proven fallible, then pretty soon every atom and molecule in the whole show will want the lead part. Nothing will follow anything, and existence itself will unravel. You're just going to have to let Ravana tie you up and take the most beautiful women of your kingdom back to his harem to seduce through his graces, his intelligence, his wealth and power. And so it goes. Ravana chains up the god of death himself and prances him around the underworld in a parade. This pisses off all of the gods, and even some of the demons, to be sure. Around the time he takes over the celestial city and dethrones the Indian Zeus, Indra, they decide that enough is enough and take their complaints to Brahma, where he sits on the lotus growing out of Vishnu's belly button, while far below, Vishnu sleeps. Brahma, you've made this demon too powerful, they complain, and Brahma, not one to admit his mistakes easily, simply nods sagely as the more demanding press, seriously, do something about it. Well, Brahma chimes, in that Indian accent where the tip of his tongue never leaves the roof of his mouth. He can be killed by monkeys and humans. Why don't you all take births as monkeys and humans and then sort it out? And he does one of those non-committal Indian head bobs to show he has understood what was bothering them and resolved it, and that now they can all move happily along since he has done his part. A monkey? Some goddess asks. You want me to become a parasite-ridden monkey? That sounds awful. There's a tribe called the Venaras that seem to have a pretty good society going. Their king, Bali, actually fought and beat Ravana once, says one of the sagely demigods. A younger god asks, Ravana defeated? How? A pelican saw the whole thing. Bali was sitting and watching the sunset. Ravana was looking for a good fight and came on his flying chariot. He landed as quietly as he could, then snuck up on Bali. The next thing the bird saw, Bali had Ravana's ten necks wrapped between his legs and was slapping them. Ravana tried to run away, but Bali was just riding him around and laughing like he was playing drums. Then the proud demon king begged to be let go, and Vali jumped off with a laugh and went back to watching the sunset. Why don't we just hire Vali to kill him? Have you ever tried making a deal with a monkey? And so the gods, who could not beat Ravana in the form of gods, decide to take birth as Venaras, and for a good forty years, the jungle of the monkeys is full of some wicked acrobatics and magic. Of course, when you take birth, you don't remember your previous incarnation. So these monkeys had no idea that they were really gods in monkey suits. They all thought they were just really, really awesome.